we're going to consider this morning verses 5 through 13. I think I said last week I wasn't looking forward to these ones. But my heart's been warmed as I've gone through them. And I pray that God will help me communicate to you what they have to say to us. I've titled the sermon this morning, Faith Training. Faith Training. Chapter 12 follows on from chapter 11. The great cloud of witnesses are those who have lived by faith and proved God as faithful. And now what the writer is doing is he's exhorting his readers, us, to make it our business to live by faith and to understand that that is God's goal and purpose for us, that we might experience his holiness and know the peaceable effect or peaceable fruit of righteousness. So as we look at these verses, don't just see the words, remember the purpose. Faith, training. Training is something we experience at different times in life, isn't it? From the very youngest potty training, to training to drive a car, all the way through life, even when you're our age. There's still times of training. We're going to have a training session in here on the defibrillator next month. We need to learn things. We need to not only learn them, but actually understand so that they become significant and fit into the lives that God has given us. God is training every Christian for the day that they will finally cross the line and enter into eternal rest. And I have to confess that whether it applies to you or not, I'm in constant need of training. Not only new things, but to be reminded of the old things. So I have three subheadings for us this morning. First of all, God trains children. God trains his children, but it spoiled my alliteration. Secondly, God trains Christians. And thirdly, God trains champions. For I believe that every Christian that completes this course is a champion. We receive crowns, don't we? And the crown in the scripture is not the king's crown, it's the winner's crown, it's the athlete's crown. And that's God's purpose, to get you over the finishing line and bring his glory to bear. So let me go into this and, and show you what I've found in the passage. The first section from verses 5 through to 8 establish a very familiar principle that children need training. Children need training. And as Christians, we are born again. We become babes in Christ. We are then to grow up into maturity as Christians. Now that won't happen just by sitting in a dark corner waiting for a powerful zap from somewhere. As you read the Word, the Word is given to us so that we might know, understand and develop as Christians. It's important to remember this. Why is the writer putting these words in here? Because he's aware of the danger of discouragement. Did you notice in verse 3 as we read it again? Lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul, not just in your body on the outside. So that inside you there is just that overwhelming negativity which disconnects you from reality. Training is necessary so that when the discouraging times come, then you know that God is not punishing you. He's training you. Like any athlete, they have to give themselves to a great deal of practice, practice, practice. So that while, when the day comes, they are ready to act. I often think about that in the context of soldiers. Why do they do so much square bashing? Why do they do so much responding to orders? They spend weeks and months at it. And we have a very distinguished elderly soldier with us. Talk to him later. It's so that when they're in the front line and they're told what to do, they do it. 
all that marching, all that instruction. It's so that they be, <coughs> they might understand that in the right circumstances they have to respond. And so it is as Christians. You and I need to understand that training is part of human life. Can I emphasize again a factor that really impressed itself upon me as I went through this? When a Christian gets into hard times, it's not punishment. Jesus paid it all, not some. And there is now, therefore, no condemnation. My favorite, well, possibly one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Romans 8.1. No condemnation. God hasn't got a, a, a sort of a, a dark book of things that he still needs to correct us for. And therefore when trouble comes, and the sad truth is it will come, it will surprise you sometimes, intrude into your life. And you'll feel the, 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 the initial sort of gut feeling is, why has God allowed this to happen to me? There will be a, a great range of answers to why those circumstances have come. But if you can perceive of them as training, then they're transformed. Trouble has the ability to really cloud our thinking. Most of us here have raised children. Somewhere in your raising children, you had to frustrate their ambitions. You had to tell them they were not going to do something which they wanted to do. And maybe perhaps in a real moment of passion, you've heard them saying, I hate you. Christian, look at this passage. Verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons, daughters. What's this exhortation? It's from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be rebuked when you be discouraged when you're rebuked with him, for whom the Lord, look at that word, five little letters in ink on your page, for whom the Lord, I want you to see it, loves. He chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. That's pretty all-inclusive, isn't it? That's pretty non-negotiable. And therefore passages like this are in here so that you and I are, are, are actually aware that when it comes, it, it, it shouldn't be allowed to continue to surprise us. I say continue because it inevitably does. But once you get your head round it and allow God's word to speak, if you endure chastening, notice that word, that will be the fourth time it's occurred in these verses. Where did we get the pattern of enduring? Christ endured the cross. You remember the meaning of endured? I'm not going to explain it. I've told you time and time again, no? Too much like a school teacher there. But you know, the meaning... Let me tell you, to keep going under pressure. So chastening is not a nice thing. We're not masochists. We don't say, oh, I love being in trouble. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as, hallelujah, sons. To as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become Children of God. That's our status, Christian. That's our hope and confidence. Not that I suddenly improved my own lot, but that God in Christ died for me and has saved me and will bring me to glory. For what son is there whom a father does not chase? You see, he's gone back just to letting you reflect upon the reality of uh, human experience. I've seen a complete change in how parents raise children. But even modern parents don't allow children to run riot all the time, do they? I remember watching my grandchildren being sent to the naughty step. 
And it was quite a frequent experience for them. Every child who has a loving parent is being transformed through that parent's action. If you are without chastening, look at this verse. And this should make you get on your knees and say, Lord, help me to see the chastening. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, I hesitate to repeat these words, then you are illegitimate and not sons. There are no Christians without chastening. Because God loves us too much to leave us as we are. Somebody cleverly wrote, God only had one son, and even he was chastened. He learned obedience. It's way back in chapter 4 or chapter 2, isn't it? He learned obedience. So therefore, my dear friends, Christian brother and sister, let's just recognize that God knows absolutely every detail of our lives, what's going to happen. He knows we're living in a broken world. He knows there are things that are going to impact us and if it were possible at all, knock us right off course. But he promises to use them. Almost every Christian knows Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for good to them that love him, to them that are the called according to his purpose. It's a mark of a believer's life that we experience the ups and downs that we do. Way back in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes in chapter 4, verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man, and this is the key, isn't it? And this is what this passage has the potential to do. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And that's interesting. It's a daily process. You can't get grace for tomorrow today. It's like the manna in the wilderness. It needs to be collected. Day by day. For our light affliction, says Paul, he's been pickled in the ocean, he's been in prison, he's been beaten. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now I know that that will be hard to swallow. Especially when you're in those hard times. There's nothing more callous than to say to somebody who's struggling, God knows what is happening and, and, and you'll come through. No, we have to bear one of those burdens. We get alongside and we, we put our shoulder to their shoulder and help them through. We become comforters. But go back to what it says. No trouble means you're not family. No trouble means you're not family. You see, unbelievers, they have trouble all the time. But this is the difference between an unbeliever and a believer. The unbeliever is experiencing God's judgment. What a man reaps, he sows. I read an article by Bono last week, not my usual kind of reading. And he made the distinction between karma and grace. Apparently he's come to faith in Christ. And he says he used to think everything was karma. You get what you deserve. And then he experienced grace. But he got what he could never have deserved in a hundred lifetimes. And that's the difference between the believer and the unbeliever. Unbelievers live in a broken world with broken people and they better be on the lookout because they might get broken. And like me, you'll have met them. They're bitter. They're twisted. They can only see the black and the negative. And they're not pleasant to be around. Christian, 
This passage is a, a, a challenge to understand a, a very primary, primary basic principle in Christianity. Remember Job and all his troubles? There's a verse at the end of chapter 2. His wife says to him, curse God and die. Doesn't she? All this trouble, he must be a horrible God. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? Where is it coming from, says Job? God. The devil is his puppet. Although you'll never admit to it in public. Let this sink in. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job, notice again, did not sin with his lips. That's a, that's a, a, a very powerful and different way of looking at life. That's been lost in modern Christianity. If you go back and read the, the Puritans and the people of previous centuries, at the very heart of their lives was they understood better than I do that, that God was in absolute control of everything and when things went belly up, God was still in control. And he would even use the belly up to make you a better Christian. I read this one from a man called, I think it's John Smith, to the Christian. Afflictions are but medicines prepared with a physician's skill. Afflictions are but medicines. I almost say swallow that and then we have trouble swallowing medicine, don't we? And presented by the kind hand of a father's love, nothing shall by any means hurt him, but all things shall work together for his eternal good. He need not fear anything but sin. Whatever God sends is in love. Whatever happens is under a divine arrangement. Our light afflictions, which are but for a moment, work out for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I need help to have that in my life. Because it's so easy to forget that God loves us too much to leave us as we were. He is the best parent. In fact, he is the perfect example for any parent. Significant. He's most regularly called our Father. Take time to reflect on it. Take time to let it sink in. Remember that when Jesus says that we are to take up our cross, he says it's to be our cross. The very person next to you will have a different cross to the one you've got. It will be matched to their personality, their temperament, their circumstances. It will be designed to bring out some new aspect of their faith in God. And when you begin to struggle to get your head around such concepts... And the whole world changes. It was C.S. Lewis who said, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our work. He shouts at us in our pain. Now I know that. There are different aspects of that to everybody's life, but surely, dear friends, you and I need to, 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 to steep in this part of the world to understand that God's busy preparing me for glory. And no matter how unpleasant the present is, that's my destination. Let the unbeliever tremble. Because if this is not happening in your life, 
Remember, you're illegitimate. It's not so much an issue nowadays, is it? There was a time when to be called illegitimate was a real slap in the face. And sometimes I wish I had the skill of Whitfield to be able to picture it for you so that I could move your heart and mind and soul to flee to Christ, but I can't. That's his business. It's mine to tell you. There are only two ways through life. One goes right up, and the other one goes straight down. You know which one you're on. Run the race looking to Jesus. There's not a middle bit in between where you can sort of stand back and say, well, I need some time to think. God says today, in fact, it's Hebrews, isn't it? Today, if you hear his voice, you know what comes next? Do not harden your heart. It's your responsibility. Flee to Christ. He goes on then to say that God trains Christians. Let me show you what I mean in verses 9 through 11. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed, for a few days, chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You see the contrast? I'm sure even as, I, as you read them, you get some flash through your mind of some day that your mother or your father disciplined you and, 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 and said no to you. But you usually do it with a smile. Because now you have the advantage of hindsight. And you can see what a wonderful thing it was that you weren't allowed to. And what he's asking us to do here is to, to, to get our heads round the fact that, that if, if you want, you see, God knows your potential. And like a, a, a personal trainer, an athletic coach, he's applying his understanding to our poor body frames that we might strive to become all that he has designed us to be. What does God want my life to look like? There are two things in the passage. I can find other things elsewhere, but I'll stick with this. One is holiness. That's not usually our priority. But it's God's. As we read, verse 14 was one I learned years ago. Pursue peace with all men and holiness. Bishop Rell's book's based on that verse, isn't it? Without which no man or woman or boy or girl will see the Lord. God is holy. 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 Be holy for I am holy. How do I get holiness? By submitting to God's discipline. Like the athlete who's trained and trained and trained for four years to go to the Olympic to get a little bit of medal on a, a bit of ribbon. I'm glad they do. I admire them for what they do. Where do I find holiness? In Christ. Chapter 10, isn't it? You he has perfected forever. Did you know you were perfect? I'm sure you've got somebody that tells you you're not, but God says you are if you're in Christ. You've been justified with faith, by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, that's the legal statement. Now God says, I want to see it in your life. And it's my business to work in your circumstances, young or old, so that, so that your focus is moved from being immersed in your own world <coughs> to being immersed in him. 
That, dear friends, is what this, this chastening, as it is all about. Verse 10, isn't it? I've lost it for a minute. He for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Peter talks about us being partakers of the divine nature. I always remember Robert Murray McShane's words, Lord, make me as holy as a sinful man can be. So that my prayers day after day should, Lord, don't, don't take away my trouble until they've made me holy, until they've got me to that place where I am like Christ, where I'm resting in him, I'm trusting him, I'm looking to him. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What's that joy? I go to Luke 15. Three times we're told what that joy is. The shepherd finds the lost sheep and he comes home rejoicing. The lady finds the lost coin and she, she has the greatest section of joy with all her friends coming. The father loses his son. The son comes home. Wow, what a day that there shall be joy in the presence of the angels of God. I, I never hesitate repeating that from Luke 15. Notice it's not the angels who are rejoicing. The joy is in the presence. And whose presence are they in? Almighty God. You see, Jesus is standing at the finishing line. He's cheering you on. He's providing you with the cups of water. And, and, and energy drinks to keep you going and going in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you cross that line, there'll be such a such a thrill. Right here and now, you see. It's his purpose to make us holy and to bring into our life the peaceable fruit of righteousness. It's his goal. And, and, and you can almost test how you're coping with your troubles by asking the question, do I want God to make me more holy? Do I want the peaceable, let me get the word right, fruit of righteousness? Because it's there for us. As God uses our troubles to strip away the, the weight of the sin that so easily besets us. As God says, look, I know you can't understand what's going on right now. Trust me. That's faith, isn't it? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's that which makes our hope real and visible. It was that which equipped Noah to build a great big ship for a hundred years in a place that wasn't even near the ocean. I feel like I'm often. It really is a challenge. Husbands, love your wives, says Paul to the Ephesians. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. We, we quite often stop there because that's beautiful, isn't it? That he might sanctify, that's make holy, and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Here, dear friends, the water of the word is splashing into your face. And you're putting your hands in and saying, Lord, cleanse me, make me holy. I'll deal with the nature of holiness in verse 14 when we get there. I want to, 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 to work with a broad brush at the present. Let's understand what's going on. Cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. You can't read this book without understanding the priority of holiness. That's God's priority. That's why Jesus died. That's why the Holy Spirit has been poured out into the world. To make us like Jesus. 2 Peter 1.4 By which we have been given us 
with, sorry, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. That through these you might be partakers. You see, he's not going to dump it in a bucket in our lives. It comes as the word washes us. Flushes out. The pollution. And brings us to glory. And then brings about this fruit of righteousness. You see, these Jewish Christians are struggling. They're having trouble on every side. They're being attacked earlier on. They've had their goods taken away. They've not yet been killed for what they believe. But that the life is really difficult. And he acknowledges no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless. And maybe you need to underline that. God is not saying to you, become a stoic. Pretend it doesn't hurt. It does. And if you've been on the Christian road any length of time, you can identify in your mind's eye times that have really been painful. Which if it had been left to you, you would have avoided. But through which God brought you nearer to himself in Christ. And by which God magnifies his own name. Mr. Spurgeon says, No one expects to see apples or plums on a tree that was planted a week ago. Only little children put their seeds into the flowering flower garden and expect to see them grow into plants in an hour. Much like Whitfield did a powerful way with words. And Christian, you and I need to understand that, that God has this purpose for our life which he's not going to give up on. To bring us to glory and to give us the peaceable, that's a lovely phrase, I'm maybe going to have to move on from it, fruit of righteousness. Righteousness is being right. God is righteous. The peaceable fruit of righteousness is living a life which pleases God. God trains Christians because he wants us to be champions. He wants us to be those who know his presence in our life now and look forward to crossing the finishing line. And so you get verses 12 and 13, they're beautiful. Long before Whitfield, God was inspiring the writer here to use language which is full of pictures. Does it reflect you at any time? It does me, especially Monday morning. Therefore, he's now going to apply what he's just been explaining. Strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. Can I ask you a question? Whose responsibility is this? There are some folks in a generation gone by who talked about let go and let God. They're genuine believers, I don't doubt that, but I, I think they forgot about verses like this. This is God saying, take a grip. Take yourself in hand, and there's this incredibly delicate balance, isn't there? Between what God has done in Christ, what God is doing through the Holy Spirit and the promise of his word, and then our responsibility to take it as our own. It would be quite possible for all of us to leave here and forget all of this immediately. It would be much better for us if we could take this and say, help, Lord. I've read what it says. But where, where, I've tried some of this and I've not succeeded. Thankfully, God is our Father and he doesn't say, because you failed once, you're going to fail always. 
Do you remember Paul's words in Philippians 4.13? If you have to look it up, shame on you. You should know that verse off by heart. Sorry, that was too hard. But really, Philippians 4.13 should be branded into our minds. Because otherwise, what we've done is we've made a works religion. I can do all things. How? Through Christ. Hallelujah. Through Christ. He suffered that I might succeed. He suffered to bring many sons to glory. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So when I read verse 12, I need to put Philippians 4.13 right alongside it. Because we've got a whole book, not just selected verses, have we? And then recognize the picture here is beautiful. Therefore, strengthen the arms that hang down. He's recognising, you see, that for Christians there are times when, when the circumstances have become so overwhelming that they can hardly get out of bed. What's the solution? Get out of bed. And do it because that's what God has called you to and that's what God promises to equip you to do. You'll probably know Kath's brothers being in hospital for that massive surgery. They had him on his feet the next day. Only for a few minutes to the chair and back into the bed. Because they recognise you. See, if you just lie still and go, Bleh, you'll not get well. I remember it with Tim Walker Cox, he had his hip joint replaced and they marched him around the room the next day. What's going on? They know that you, you, for your body to function, the whole system needs to be working together. And that's what you have here, dear friends. I need this lesson as much as you. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down. I can't get away from the picture and the, the feeble knees. I don't know if it's just old age, but they seem to be more familiar than they were in years gone by. And then get on with living for Christ. Remember, we have to run the race. Well, you have to run the straight path. Where do you find the straight path? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Follow Jesus. Look to him. Understand what he's done for you. And, 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 and take it one step at a time, as they say. This is not an exhortation to click your fingers and suddenly be a, 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 a super athlete. This is an exhortation to trust me. That's faith, by the way, isn't it? You're going to have a baby, but I'm 99 years old. Come on, logic tells you it doesn't happen, it does. We'll be looking tonight at Mary's story. And now she says, how can this be? I've never known a man. The power of the Holy Spirit is the key. And she has to confess that with God, nothing is impossible. Nothing. Oh, my dear brother and sister, and please notice that emphasis I'm not talking down to you. I'm so often like the person in verse 13 that's lame and limping. And, and, and the solution to it is leaning on Christ. People will disappoint you. You will disappoint yourself. But we have a saviour who's altogether lovely. The fairest of 10,000 to our souls. You and I need to, 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 to go forward. He's using Isaiah 35, the commentaries tell me, to, to bring this point out. And it was given to Israel when they were under oppression. This was to be how they were to come through their Babylonian captivity. What was that like? I've never experienced anything like having my house knocked down and burnt and chains put on me and ring through my nose and 
hauled off naked or half naked halfway across the world. When I get the opportunity to visit people, especially those who are ill, I like to read Isaiah 40 and 31. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. Walk and not faint. I pray that by God's grace, you will have heard this great, great exhortation. And remember the race that is being pictured is a marathon where everybody that crosses the line is a winner. So there's hope for all of us to keep going. He's not pretending it's easy. Nobody likes it. That's what he said, isn't it? But we know that it'll have a good outcome. As a hymn we're all familiar with, it was written by a man called Horatio Palmer. And, and it says that one day he was working on his music theory exercise and the idea of the hymn came to him and he wrote it down quickly as possible with few exceptions the hymn has remained as it's written what is the hymn yield not to temptation for yielding is sin each listen each victory will help you some other to win fight manfully onward dark passions subdue look ever to jesus he will carry you through he Ask the Saviour to help you. That's the key, isn't it? The whole power of difference between knowing and doing. How did the time get that far? There's a whole power of difference. Ask the Saviour to help you. Comfort, strengthen and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. My dear, dear, dear friends, that's where we are. And we need to look with pity then on the unbeliever. They've got to carry all the junk of this world in their own strength. Is it any wonder they end up so bitter and twisted and that wickedness dominates as it does? If all there is is this life, then we are of all men most miserable. Paul to the Corinthians. best training comes from God and the best way to function in training is to accept it as coming from somebody who loves you your heavenly father the tests are always unexpected but God is the same yesterday, today and forever you'll see that in chapter 13 won't you? but we're not there yet may God by his grace Enable and equip you for this race. Amen. Seven five.